removed from their sight. But one question I'd like to ask them, what's wrong with living right? What's wrong with living right? I think, thinking as they're singing that, serving God with all of my might. What's wrong with living right? What's wrong with doing the right thing? Is living right a worthy enough cause for you to give, to serve God with all of your might, to serve God with everything, with all of your energy, with all of your heart, with all of your soul? Is it a worthy enough cause, this cause of Jesus Christ, this word that he has entrusted us with, is this a worthy enough cause for you to give everything that you have? Amen. If, if not just the, the thought of heaven, if not, not just the thought of heaven, but is, is even that enough? Amen. Is that enough to get you to be all in, to be completely committed, to be steadfast? To persevere through what all obstacles that life throws at you. Is it enough? I mean, think about what Jesus Christ done for you. Is him, him giving his life on Calvary, is that enough? Is that enough for you to endure until the very end? To endure all it is that life has to, to offer you? All it is, all the hardships of life. Is him giving his life on the cross enough for you to be fully committed? Give your life for, to save it. Is it enough? Amen. To pick up your cross, to deny yourself, amen, and follow him, is it enough? What's wrong with it, anyways? The world, the world they, they want to convince you that living right is wrong. They want to convince you that 
evil is good and good is evil. They want, they want you to believe that. The devil has a mantra. The devil has a, a, a theme that he has peddled over the years, over the many years, over since the cross, he's been peddling this same idea, the same ideology that evil is good and good is evil. And by its much speaking and by our much hearing and by being completely everywhere that we look, Amen. Our children now have a hard time seeing the difference between right and wrong. <laughs> because the world is convinced that it's all right. The world, because they've heard it so often, and because it's been pressed upon them so much, that now our children, unless they're taught in a home where a man, a, a mom and a dad will stand up, or a, or a mom or a dad, whoever, if somebody will stand up and tell them, Tell them that the way to live is to live for Jesus Christ. Unless somebody will stand up and show them by example that the only way that you'll have joy in this life, the only way that you can obtain salvation, and there is salvation, is if you live for Jesus Christ, if you follow the guides of this Bible. Because the world will not tell them that. The world's not going to try to convince them that. The world wants to tell them the exact opposite of that. The world wants to tell them that any kind of evil, perverse way to live is okay, and they're lying to them. But that's because the devil don't want them to make heaven their home. The devil wants them to, he loves, misery loves company. And he don't care if it's the little babies, or if you're 100 years old, he still wants your soul. He still wants you to be in hell with him, that's what he wants. And the world will convince you that the only thing... The, the one thing that will matter in this life, the world will try to convince you and the devil will try to convince you it's not worth your time or your energy or your effort. But it's the only thing that will stand when, it's all, when it all boils down, when it's all said and done, when your bank account burns to the ground, the only thing that will stand is the things that you've done for Jesus Christ. That's it. Amen. Brother Howard said, I don't think it won't be hard. Don't think it's going to be easy. Don't think it won't be hard. This is a life, you live a life for Jesus Christ, yeah, you're going to have hard times living a life without God. For Living a life for yourself is hard enough. Don't think it won't be, won't be a, a, a life of trial and sometimes heartache and hurt and sometimes you be, you'll have to give more than you think you can give, but you can do it. You can give it. You have, you have more to give than you even realize because you are with Jesus Christ because one with God is the majority, the true majority, amen? I believe that. I believe that God will strengthen us. Through Him, we'll be strengthened and we'll be able to stand the test of time. We'll be able to stand this barrage of evil and perversion and, and promiscuity and the things that the world preaches to our children that's gonna, that they're trying to send them to hell. Amen. But we have to pick, pick up our cross yeah. as the responsible ones. Amen. As the adults here. Let's be responsible. Let's live our life according to the word of God. Amen. Amen. I love the Lord. I love God. I love living for God. I love the, being his servant. I love nothing more than that. That's the thing, that I, the thing that I appreciate most in this life is to be able to serve the one true God. To know that who the one true God is, that Jesus Christ is the only name, is the one true God. And to know him is everything to me. To know him and to be at his service is absolutely everything that I could ever hope for in this life. You know, Friday night... I tell you, Friday night I enjoyed that. Brother Denton, I, I like Brother Denton to just, he'll preach at me and he'll tell me the truth, <laughs> whether you want to hear it or not, you know. I want to hear the truth, don't you? I want to hear the truth. The, you know that old saying, the truth hurts? Yeah, well, it's supposed to hurt because it's going to save your life. It's supposed to hurt because it's trying to get you to go the direction you're supposed to go. It's trying to point out the things in your life that you need to take care of. Amen. But Friday night after the preaching, we had an altar call. And I counted up here to see how many people. We had over 60 people. I stopped counting at 60. And when we called an altar call, there was not a single person 
that was standing up back there talking. Not a single person that was sitting at their seat visiting. Not a sing- I'm serious. Not a sing- out of all 60 people or a plus, there was not a single person that didn't come to the altar or kneel at their seat and pray. And I, and I happened to just notice that. Not that I was looking for it necessarily, but I just happened to notice it as I stood there just thinking about the word and soaking it in, the message. And every single person was praying and giving themselves to God and letting him know whatever it is that they had to tell him. I don't know what you have to tell him today, but he is here to listen. Amen. But I do appreciate that, and I'm sure he appreciates that. And you have just such little time to give yourself to God in this life. We get so busy. We're so, we're, we're so overwhelmed with things to do. Amen. And we have just such a small amount of time here together. A few hours a week. A few hours and seven days that we come together and we spend a little time in fellowship with the one true king. He deserves our attention, doesn't he? (laughs) He deserves our attention. (laughs) He's so good. Amen. Let's go to the book of 2 Timothy if we could. Second Timothy, the third chapter, or the second chapter, the third verse. The third verse it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If the whole church would pray that God would bless his word. Come forth, Lord, mighty God, give us a heart to receive your word, a mind to understand it, Lord. Glory, Lord, mighty God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing at the reading of the word. It's something, I thank you for that, for standing when you hear the word of God being read. Amen. As we open the book and we go to a chapter and verse, and we stand in reverence to the thing that matters most in this life, the thing that makes the biggest difference, amen, that we read the word of God and we, we reverence it. When you come into a church house, this is a place to, to revere when you have God who said, I'll be in your midst, when he said, we're two or three are gathered, this is a place to revere, this is a place to reverence, this is a place to to have respect, amen, for the king. Because he's present. If you believe the king is present, would you not respect him? If you believe the king walked through the door, would you not have reverence for him? Amen. Would you not take a little bit of time and maybe listen, see what it is he has to say? Amen. And enjoy his fellowship? Amen. (laughs) I believe that the Lord comes and he dwells with those Amen, that are diligently seeking him. That have gathered together, believing in faith in his name, the true name of Jesus Christ. I believe that he is in the midst because the Bible tells me that. I do not doubt it. I believe it with everything that that is in me, everything. I believe that it's worth enduring the hardship. Amen. Enduring the hardness. To be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. (laughs) The Greek translation translates that, take thy share in suffering. To endure the hardness. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, take thy share in in suffering. (laughs) And we'll do that. We'll all have our part if we serve God. We'll all have our part that we'll have to endure if we serve God with a true heart. Amen. If we love him as we're to love him, if we love him with our mind, heart, and soul, with everything that we have, if we love God like that, we'll take our part in the suffering. We sure will. But the Bible says endure. It's worth enduring. It's worth enduring. Believe me, the reward is great to those that have endured, to those that have overcome, to those that have lived this life and persevered through all trials, through all troubles, through all heartaches, through all adversity. We've stood and we've endured The reward is going to be great. I believe that. 
We all, we've all asked ourselves, or we've asked of the church, or maybe you've asked of a, uh, of a minister, or a pastor, or maybe at one time you asked Brother Howard, or you've asked, what is it that I can do? What is my job? What is, what is it? I need, I need something to do. I need more to do. What is my purpose? You don't, need to te- you don't need somebody to tell you what your purpose is. I'm just telling you. You don't need me to tell you what your job is. You don't need me to tell you what, the, what your purpose is. The Bible told you already. The Bible has a list of things right here. The Bible is everything that you need to know. All the answers are right here. What is it that you want to know? Open the Bible. Find out. It's right here. It tells you exactly how to live, what exactly is expected of you. Amen. And it tells you that if you, you believe that, the, that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Amen. It, there, believe that there's something better waiting for you. But in this life, here, here. Paul, as he's preaching to Timothy, as he's telling him, as he's encouraging him, it sounds real encouraging, doesn't it? But he is encouraging him. He's trying to motivate him and tell him, hey, you got some of this coming, but it's going to be worth it. You got some enduring to do, but it's going to be worth it. Like Brother Howard said, I be- he said, I believe it's going to take all of your reserves. It's going to take all of your energy, all of your heart, all of your effort. Realize this, church, we don't get to make it to heaven just because we want to go. Just because it sounds nice, just because it's a a great idea, just because he's prepared a wonderful place for me, doesn't mean I'm going to enjoy it if I don't endure until the end, if I don't overcome, if I don't put the old man in the water and keep him there, I don't get to make it. That's just the truth. I got to overcome. You want to know what your job is? Carry out the orders of the captain. Amen. Amen. Carry out the orders of your captain. Give yourself to the conditions of your enlistment here. Give yourself to the conditions of your enlistment as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Because there, there are conditions when you enlist, amen, as a soldier in the army of Jesus Christ. There are conditions to be met just as you would in the military and in the, in the armed services of the United States of America. There are conditions that will be met. You will meet those conditions. There are things that are required of you or you will not be in the army. You will not be in the Marine Corps or the Navy or the Air Force or the National Guard or whatever branch of service it is. If you don't meet the conditions of your enlistment, you don't get to make it. It's the same with Jesus Christ. There are conditions for your enlistment in this job as a soldier of Jesus Christ. The rewards pay much better than the U.S. military. They don't pay a soldier what they're worth, I'll tell you that. For a person that would give their whole life, that would offer themselves on the battlefield, some that would lay it down and their families would suffer for years to come because the government don't pay that well. Not to the soldiers, not to the guys that are on the front line, guys that are given everything that they have. I, I'm just being honest. I mean, that's the dividends that God pays are great. The reward is great. And you'll see the reward in this life and the next, I believe, that I believe I've enjoyed the reward of God in this life already. I've enjoyed, I, I've endured hardships. I've had times when I hurt. I've had times when I thought, what in the world is going on? But I, I've never had times where God has failed me. Never had times where God left me alone or made me feel like I was all by myself. I never had that. I've never experienced that as I've been serving God. He's always been right there. He's always been willing to hear me, to listen, to to bend an ear towards me. And I've lamented and I've spoken and I've told him my whole heart. And he's always cared and considered me greatly. I feel like that. And I feel like he's considered you greatly. Don't, Don't wonder if you have a purpose, you do. You have a job. You have a purpose. You have a calling. Amen. You have a calling to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. To be a soldier, to be a servant, to give of yourself. To give yourself holy. Think about that. Your life is not your own anymore. You give yourself to God. It's not yours anymore to decide or to dictate what direction you go or the things that you get to do or don't do. The Bible tells you already. The world wants to tell me and your family probably has told you this before, and even people that you walked in the door of church with, they want to tell you, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. The Bible said, don't judge me. No. The Bible says it will judge you. <laughs> the Bible said this word is going to judge you. 
I'm not the judge. The judge, the judge already handed down the verdict. The judge already handed down the verdict. The verdict's already been read. If you're not applying the Bible to your life, if you're not living within the guides of this Bible, then you don't get to make it to heaven. I'm sorry if somebody told you that, they lied to you. No, I'm not going to judge you. But I'm going to tell you what's right and wrong. I'm going to tell you what's right and wrong. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you that the Bible tells you you should live a certain way, that you should read the Word, amen, that you should seek God diligently, that you should love Him with your whole heart and soul, mind, and you should love your neighbor as yourself, amen, that you should be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, that you should, amen, I'm going to tell you that. Because the Word's going to tell you exactly what it is that you need to hear. I don't, have to, I don't have to judge. I don't have to sit in judgment. I don't get to sit in judgment. The Word judges me as long, right alongside me. It judges me just as it judges you. There's no respecter of persons. <laughs> it tells me exactly the things I need in my life, and it tells you the same. Amen? No difference for me or for you or for Brother Howard. Amen? You're called to be a soldier of Jesus Christ, but I want you to look at this. I'm going I'm to stick around here in Timothy for a little while. But he says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's your job. That's your calling. Okay? You're called to be a soldier. You wanted a job to do, you got it. You want work to do, you got it. Brother Denton Howard, he preached a message one time, and it, it really has stuck with me. It's one, one of the favorite things, and he said a lot of things I really enjoy. I always like when he said, don't, don't share your false teeth with your wife. <laughs> I don't know how you make a message out of that, but it works. He made it work. <laughs> he might want to eat steak, and she might, she might not enjoy steak. Her teeth don't work as good. <laughs> but he said one time, he was talking about a soldier, and Brother Denton was a Vietnam veteran. I've heard him say that there wasn't a bullet in Vietnam that could take his life if God didn't say it, ordain it first. Amen. Isn't that something? And he said a soldier, a group of soldiers, you get a group of soldiers together and you give them nothing to do. No battle to fight. No war to be involved in. They'll give themselves to gambling and carousing and drinking and smoking. But you give them a battle to fight and they'll drop all that junk. They'll drop all that nonsense. They'll put all that nonsense behind them, and they'll stand up, and they'll put on the, the, the armor, and they'll go and fight the battle that's before them because the captain told them. The captain gave them orders. The captain said, now it's time to fight. They laid all that nonsense behind them to fight the battle in front of them. And I'm here to tell you this morning, there's never going to be a time in this life, in your life, in your present life on this planet where the battle is not raging. The battle is going to continue to rage from the beginning to the end, till you lay it down, you're on a battlefield. You have a war to fight. You have a battle to fight, a battle to be involved in. There is no time for you to carouse and to get caught up in the things of this life. There's no time for that. You don't have no time that's lax, no time where you can just take your ease, but you have a battle raging constantly. You're on the battlefield, always fighting the war. Brother Kevin talked about the mental warfare all the time, a spiritual battle, a mental battle. It's not a physical battle all the time, but you're in a battle. You're in a battle against evil, against principalities and powers of darkness. Always you're, there's a battle raging. You always have a job to do. You always have a purpose. You always have a higher calling to answer to. Your higher calling is to be a good soldier and please the one, the one true captain of your life. Amen. Amen. But know this, the life of a soldier is not a life of ease. It's not a life of pleasure. It's not a life of self-indulgence. All right? I know there's some military members in here today. I've heard a lot of your stories. I've heard a lot of your testimony. I've heard a lot of the things that you've had to endure as you come through basic training or boot camp. And maybe some of you have seen a, a little bit of a battlefield. I don't, know, I don't know all of your stories, but I've heard enough to know that you did it exactly how you were told to do it. I remember hearing the story about the, the 
mountain, I think Brother ha uh, Howard or somebody was telling about the hill that they had to climb in boot camp, and they'd carry that 90-pound rucksack, and they'd run up the hill, and wherever they had to go, they just did it. You march endless marches. Or your body don't think you can step again. Don't think you can put a foot in front of the other. But they keep marching. They give everything that they have. Being a soldier, that's what it, you know, to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. To be a soldier is not a life of ease. We want to think that just because we come in and we serve God, that our life is all of a sudden going to become a bed of roses. And we're going to live a life of ease and live in a lap of luxury. I'll tell you another thing. That prosperity gospel, that's nonsense. That's a joke. I'll just tell you the truth of the matter. It's popular, but it's nonsense. It's, it's popular. But why wouldn't it be? I mean, because it appeases, it, it appeals to the flesh. It appeals to the desires of the flesh. But it's nonsense. That's for free. 2 Timothy goes on to say, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Amen. Oftentimes, to live, live a life of a soldier is quite the opposite of a life of ease, isn't it? It's enduring innumerable hardships. Amen. Self-sacrifice, giving everything that you have to meet the conditions of your enlistment, and carry out the orders of the captain. Think of that higher calling that you have in your life. Every single one of you that are here today. Not by accident, I'll tell you. Not by accident. Not because your mama invited you or your grandmother invited you or a friend invited you. Not by accident. I tell you this all the time. You're here, for, you're here on purpose. Because God drew you in. Because you don't get to come to God without being drawn. He'll draw you in. He'll give the increase. He'll do that. We, we as the laborers, we can plant the seed and we can do the work and we can cultivate a little bit and we can nurture and we can help support, but God will give the increase. God will draw. God will draw you in. If you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. Amen. You're not here by accident. You're here because you have been called with a higher purpose, with a higher calling to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, to fight the battle that rages, to be the light that you're supposed to be to your family, to your grandchildren, to your children. To put the things behind you that are supposed to be behind you and walk according to the word of God. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We say we love God. You've heard me say it before. I've heard you say it. We say that there's no better life, which there is not. Not even, hands down, this is the best life. Easily the best life that you can live on this planet is living the life for Jesus Christ. No doubt. I'm not telling you from a place of inexperience. I'm telling you from a place of experience, knowing exactly what it's like to live in the darkness. Having lived there myself for quite some time in the darkness, knowing exactly what it's like, there is no better life than this. But it's time now, don't you think, that we really have to live, amen, like we say, <laughs> if we love God, if we say we love God, then it's time to live that way, amen. We have to really live the life that we say we love, amen. We have to really live the life that we say that we love. That means giving everything that we have, like the bishop already said. That means giving everything that you have. It's not a question of how much can I keep for myself. It's not a question of that. There's nothing that you can keep. You give it all. All of your energy, all of your heart, all of your soul, everything that you have, you give to the service of God, to the service of others, to the service of God and to the service of your neighbor. You give everything. You give everything. Not called to be great, not called to be big, not called to be more than everybody else. The Bible says I must decrease so that God can increase. I'm not trying to make myself big. I don't need something to make myself look big before men. I don't need that. I don't need to pass on the back from my fellow man. I don't need that. I need God to be pleased with me. I need God to be pleased with me. When I, when I lay down at night, I need to know that God is pleased with the life that I'm living. I can live a life according to this word of God. I can live that life. 
You believe that today? I believe that. I believe that you can live a life according to this word. I believe that you can put the old man behind you. I believe that you can put him in his place. I believe you can step on his head and you put him right where he belongs. Under your heel. Say, no, never again to be, to give me that, rear up that ugly face, that ugly past. I don't want anything to do with it. I believe you can live a life according to the word of God. Because he makes you able, he's strong in your weakness, he's strong. He gives you the ability, he gives you the tools, he gives you everything, the strength, the courage, everything that you need to live this life according to the word of God. He does allow you to do that. You don't have to live a life in sin. You don't have to live a life in sin. You don't have to live that way. You can live a life, amen, according to the word of God. You can have a made-up mind. You can have a, a purposed heart. I love it. Daniel said he, his, he had a purposed heart. It was purposed in his heart, Brother Dale. When the devil comes around and he starts to offer you nonsense that you recognize, just call it what it is. Quit messing around with that nonsense. I mean, seriously. How long are you going to do that to God? How long are you going to keep doing that same garbage to God? The one, the one that matters, the captain of your life. Amen. Just tell the devil what it is. I recognize that nonsense. Just because you got me before doesn't mean you're going to get me again. I'm done with that stuff. God changed my life. He gave me an opportunity to be a new creature. He's doing something new in me, and I'm allowing him to do that new thing. Because that new thing is the thing that I desire. That new thing is the thing that will take me from this life to the next life, from immortality to mort- or from mortality to immortality, from corruption to incorruption. He'll take me from there. Are you willing to give yourself to the life of a soldier, to the life of a servant? Amen. Yes. If that's the answer he's looking for. Yes, I'm willing to give my life as a servant. I'm willing to give my life in servitude to the Lord. With, hey, this people right here, this people is a great people. This people will show you love. They will encourage you. They will lift you up. They will help you out. They will bear your burden. They will. They've done that for me. I'm sure they've done that for you. They will pray for you. They will fast for you. They will talk to God and counsel with him for you. They will do that for you. And that's what it's about, being a servant. I tell the ministers and the deacons, we're not. We're servants. That's what we are. We're servants. To the church, we're servants to the community, we're servants. That's our job. We're not to be lifted up or to be stood up high. We're servants. We should be doing the job of the servants because that's what we are. We're in service to the, to the community, to the church, to the people that we love. When, our, when our, my brother walks in the door, I want him to see me doing the work of a servant. I want him to understand that that's my job, that's my title, that's the thing that I want to do for God, I want to be pleasing to him. I want him to see me doing the work of God that God wants me to do. Caring for others, like Brother Dale said, caring for others more than I care for myself. Thinking about others more than I think of myself. Listen to this, I wrote this down. The soldier is taken away from his family in the comforts of home. They're asked to take their bodies to the absolute end of, their, of its physical limits and sometimes its mental capabilities. Exposed to the most severe elements of nature, extreme cold and extreme heat. Brother Mike, he tells a story. I'll tell you two stories. Brother Mike tells a story about being in cold weather training, I think in Norway. And this big man that uh, he was partnered up with fell in the creek, I believe it was, fell in the water and was getting frostbite in his feet. He probably would have had toes amputated. But Brother Mike and him, they, they got down, they took all them wet clothes off, and they got in a big sleeping bag together. And Brother Mike slept with them stinky feet on his chest. You might have heard this story. <laughs> and he saved that guy's feet. You know, so I'm thinking of extreme cold. You know, you think of extreme cold and, and extreme heat. They give themselves to the elements. 
And sometimes we do that same thing here. Sometimes we're going to be asked of that. That's going to be asked of us to do whatever it takes to help our brother, to lift him up. We have a tendency to kick him while they're down. Amen. We have t Brother Tony used to sing that song, What If I Stumble, What If I Fall? I love that song. Because our mentality, the world's mentality is, if you stumble, I'm kicking you while you're down, and you're not getting back up. Our mentality shouldn't be that. If we see our brother or sister stumble or fall, we should be right there beside of them, putting a shoulder underneath of their arm and picking them up and helping them to walk on a narrow path again. That should be our job, not to point fingers at them, to laugh at them, to say that they can't do it. Amen. To, to speak of them in our circles of their failures and how, how much they've failed and how little they've accomplished and how little they've contributed to the church in our, in our little circles of, no, we should lift them up. We should build them up. We should encourage them. Our thoughts should be, how can I encourage them to do more for the church? How can I encourage them and edify them to do more for God? The soldiers asked to sustain life on just enough rations to stay alive. Keep moving forward. Many times giving all that they have and even giving their lives for their country's sake. Willing to endure it all to carry out the captain's orders. And I think about that. And I don't, you know, I know the military has changed, but a man that would give himself to service of another. There's something to be said of that. That you, would, that you would take that opportunity, that you take that chance for very little pay, very, very little gratification, very little acknowledgement. You would go out and you would give of yourself, that whether it be four years or eight years or a lifetime. And then to even make it to the battlefield where you may be asked to give your life. And, I, and the soldier will do that. The soldier has a mentality to do that. You, you know, I, I always think of the greatest generation you know, they call the greatest generation how they give their lives on those beaches of Normandy, how they just opened the doors of those little, those boats, and they all just ran out. The enemy was on the hill, and they was just picking them off. I mean, and they just ran out into the danger, not thinking a thought for themselves at all. Not thinking at all a thought for themselves, but just following out the captain's orders, just doing what they were told to do without thought. Just doing what, what they were told to do, though it might hurt them, though it may cause pain, though it may even end their life, they're going to do whatever it is that they were asked to do by the captain, and they did it. And I think about that as Jesus Christ is asking us today, are you willing to give your life for it? Are you willing to endure hardness? Shouldn't we give the same reverence to our Savior, to the captain of our life, and we should say willingly, Lord, I'm willing to give my whole life for it? I'm willing to lay down. I'm willing to pick up my cross and follow you and give everything that I have for you because you are the only worthy cause in this life. Amen. Shouldn't we, though? 2 Timothy, go on, it says, And if a man also strive for masters, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. And he tells Timothy, Consider what I say. Paul giving him a little lecture here. <coughs> I often imagine what Paul was like. Haven't you probably, if you read the Bible and you read this a lot. But he said, consider what I say, Timothy, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. He just gave him a speech about being a, a soldier. Being pleasing to God. If a man strive for masters, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. lawfully. He talked to Talk to him about the husbandman that laboreth, the farmer, the man that would till the ground. And then he said, understand what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you something here. I'm trying to tell you that labor and sacrifice come before reward. Labor and sacrifice come before the finish, come before the reward. Labor and sacrifice must be met. These requirements, these things must be met before you can reap the benefits and, and enjoy the reward of your labor. There has to be labor and sacrifice. I've been watching, well, I haven't really had time, but I know that the Olympics were, trials were on. And I, I remember as a, a kid watching the Olympics and thinking about, you know, one of my, my absolute favorite thing about the Olympics is when an American athlete will stand on a podium and they'll play the national anthem and they'll put their hand over their heart 
and they'll cry, and they'll start singing that national anthem, and then they'll bend down and they'll put that little ribbon of gold, that little gold medal on their neck. But that national anthem comes up, and they raise that United States of America flag. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I still love living in America, you know. It still feels good. But you think of that athlete that gave everything to get that gold medal, that strived. The, the athlete that, I mean, think about what it takes to be an Olympian, to be a gold medal winner. You don't get to eat what you want. You don't get to do what you want. You're not going to be, you're not getting to sit around playing Nintendo and looking at Facebook all day eating Cheetos. No, that's not going to happen. No, you're going to give yourself to a strict diet, to a strict regimen of training, running miles and miles and lifting weights and working hard at your craft so that you can get that gold medal because that means something. That reward means something. They're looking for a reward. All that labor is not in vain. They're not just laboring because they love the labor. They're not working because they love the work. But they're working for the reward that's to come. If they give everything that they have and they perfect their craft and they do the things that they need to do to, to finish the race and finish on top, they get that gold medal. They get honors and accolades that they're looking for. Right. It's the same thing in Jesus Christ. The labor is not the greatest part. It's hard sometimes. It's hard to endure sometimes. Enduring the hardness as a good soldier is not, right in, the, right in the words itself, is not easy. It's not always easy, but the reward is worth it. The reward is coming. The crown is coming. Yeah. Sister Wanda, when I get to finally enjoy that valley of peace and I get to finally put on that white robe, when I can finally lay down my armor and I can finally lay down that, those garments, of the soldier's garments, because one day, right now the battle rages. But one day the battle will be over. One day the battlefield will be empty. I'm looking for that day. I'm working for that day. I'm going to stay in the fight until that day. Because one day the battlefield will be empty, Brother Dell. And they'll look around. There will be no more fight to fight. There will be no more battle to fight. No more hardness to endure. There is a coming a day when there will be no more of that. When I'll be finally able to bask in the glory of the, of the Lord, where the glory of Jesus Christ will outshine the sun, I want to live for that day. I want to enjoy that day. I'm looking for that reward. This hardness that we'll endure now is just a little bit of a thing. This isn't no big deal. This is a light affliction compared to the reward that we're going to have in Jesus Christ. Endure it. Endure it. The reward is coming. The reward is great. No more no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more heartache, no more loss of a loved one, no more, no more of that. Most of all, I can kneel at the feet of the one true God. Most of all, I can bow at the feet of the one true God. I can enjoy true fellowship, and I'll know God as he is. Amen. I'll finally see God as he is. In all of his glory, he'll come back. In all of his glory, I'll know him. And the reward will be great. Trust me, the reward will be great. The farmer, he says, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. And you think of the farmer. I, I was thinking of him this morning. I have friends that are, that are farmers. I have a good friend that I worked with for a long time that, you know, the farmer around here, the small farmer, he'll, he'll take a loan out so that he can keep farming. Then he'll pay the, pay the loan back the next with his earnings. And then he'll get another loan so that he can keep farming. And they just barely live in, really, the small farm. And they're trying to even, trying to make it even harder on him. But that's just, that's a whole nother show. But the farmer, in the late spring, he'll cultivate the ground. He'll turn the dirt. Think about him. Laboring, sweat, by the sweat of his brow, picking up rocks and throwing them in a pile. I, I got my farmer friend, I, I've hunted his property. He's got a row of rocks, big as, it, I mean, it's longer than this church. They're piled up probably five or six feet tall. Of over the years of farming, 40 years of picking up rocks and throwing them in a wagon and dumping them in a pile. I mean, it's a massive pile of rocks. And he's just laboring and he's working and he's giving everything that he has to that, to that labor. Planting the seed and he's looking into the distant future of the fall and he knows that he's going to enjoy the harvest. He knows that the harvest is coming. It's not right now. The harvest isn't right now for him, but the harvest is coming. So he's putting the work in now. 
So in the depth of the winter, when it's cold out, he's going to sit down at the table and his family is going to enjoy the grain and the fruit of his labor as he has worked and strived and done everything that he can to make sure that they're all right. We should be doing the same in Jesus Christ. We should be doing the same in God. We should be doing the same in this church. Amen. Striving and working and laboring and and enduring because we want our families to be saved. Because we want them to enjoy the reward. Amen. Amen. Second Timothy, the first chapter. And I'm going to read 8 through 12 here real quick. It says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Listen to this. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Not according to our works, our desires, my wants, but according to his own purpose, he called you. According to his own purpose, he called you. Not for your benefit, necessarily. It will benefit you, but he didn't call you for your benefit. He called you for his own purpose. To take care of the things of God. To take care of the things in the word of God. He called you for his purpose. The reward will be great, but you are called and bought with a price. Paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. You were paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. Your life is not your own anymore. And we get caught up in that. It's hard for us as as uh, rebellious by nature. Because we live in this flesh, it's hard for us to give ourselves and yield ourselves to God, the one true king. It's, it's hard for us. We have to overcome that, that I can do what I want to do. <laughs> one of the things I hate hearing, I'm a man, I can do what I want. <laughs> and I have reason for not liking that. I'm a man, I can do what I want. Okay. Yeah, when I became a man, I put away childish things. When I became a man, I put away childish things. I put the things of the world behind me. That's what I, when I became a man, you want to you wanna tell me that you're a man and then live according to the flesh and still do childish things? When I became a man, I put away childish things. I put the life of perversion behind me, the promiscuity behind me, the drinking behind me, the drugging behind me. I put that behind me. When I became a man, I put the filthy mouth behind me. And I put away childish things. Amen. <laughs> Start treating people better. Start acting right. Spitting white. Walking according to the word of God. <laughs> Amen. It's a different life. It's a different life. I don't have to live a life to fit in with the world with a vulgar mouth and a vulgar mind and a vulgar mentality. I don't have to live that way. Quit kidding yourself. You don't have to live that way. You're stronger than that. God gave you more power than that. He gave you power to overcome. He gave you power to overcome. To overcome what? To overcome sin and iniquity and darkness. That's what he gave you power over. You don't have to live a life according to the flesh. You have power and authority. If you have the Holy Ghost, if you have the Holy Ghost, The Spirit of God living within you, you have the power and authority over iniquity. People say, why don't you live like that? Why would I live like that? I've lived like that, and I know what it brings me, nothing. Heartache, sorrow, misery, that's what it brings me. If you've lived there, you know that. You've experienced it. That's all there is there, living in darkness. Living as a transgressor in this world, that's all there is. I've been there. But he says, he's telling Timothy here, he says, you're not called according to your own purpose, but you're called according to his own purpose. And grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto, Paul says, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him 
against that day. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, you got a job to do. Timothy's going to be a minister. You got a message to preach. You got a gospel to preach. Not my gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You got a job to do to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. You got a, a job to do to share the gospel of Christ that's been entrusted to us. You want a job? You got a job. You want a purpose? You got a purpose. We all have a purpose. We all have a job to be what God called us to be. He says, Timothy, you wanted a job. You got a job. But let me tell you, it's going to be hard. Brother Howard, it's not going to be life of ease. You're going to take everything you got. You're going to take all that you have. All of your ability, all of your energy to put away the flesh. To put the old man behind you. It is. It is, and sometimes it will take a while to get that figured out, and that's all right. Take a little while if you have to, but get it figured out. <laughs> Let's get it figured I, I, I would suggest you get it figured out faster, sooner than later. Right. Amen. Some of you have been trying a long time. Somebody, some of you guys have been working on this a long time, trying to get it figured out, knowing, knowing what you really needed to do. I tell everybody it's the same answer, always the same answer. Never is different. The answer never changes. Somebody comes to me with a problem. Somebody comes to me because they don't want to live anymore on this planet. I tell them I got the answer. Somebody comes and tells me my marriage is falling apart. My, my marriage is a train wreck. My wife did this or my husband did this. I, I know the answer. I know the answer. Someone comes and tells me my kids are having struggles. My kids are in drugs. My kids are doing this or doing that. And my kids act like they hate me. I know the answer. Same answer. It's always Jesus Christ. It's always the same answer. You want, you want a true difference in your life? Then you have to have God, and you have to be fully committed to him. You have to be committed to Jesus Christ. You have to let him be the captain of your life. You, let, you have to let him dictate the direction you go. My life every day is not without thought. There's, no, I, there's not, not a time without thought. You talk about idle words. Idle words. They're not, they're not words without consequence. They're idle, but that's because they're words without thought. But every morning, you got to make a decision. I wake up. I'm going to pray. What am I going to put on today? How am I going to look? What's going to come out of my mouth? Am I going to look and reflect Jesus Christ in everything that I do? Am I? In everything that I do, Brother Dale. In the small things and the great things, am I going to reflect Jesus Christ? In the way that I treat people, the way that I act, am I going to reflect Jesus Christ? Are people going to know? Am I going to stand out in the crowd? Am I going to be separate? Are people going to realize that I am a child of God? Just because I say I'm a child of God, are people going to recognize me as a child of God? I think I say, wow, yeah, I can see that. You are a child of God. You're living for the Lord. I can see that you live different. You're doing something different there. Amen. Anyways, let's go to Matthew. I'm going to have him come back to the music real quick. He's letting Timothy know, though, it's not, about, it's not about you, Timothy, anymore. It's not about you. It's about carrying out the captain's orders. It's about being a good soldier, being pleasing to the, the true captain of your life. It's easy to get caught up in taking care of me. It is. I, I, I understand that. It's easy to get caught up in taking care of me and mine. But don't let the devil get you with that trap either. Because it quickly becomes about more than just you. Do you expect your children to make it to heaven? When you think about your life and your walk with Christ, do you think about your grandchildren? You think about, I want you to think about this. I want you to think, I want this to sink in. I, want, I wonder how deep this can really get. Do you think about their opportunity, their opportunity at salvation? When you live your life before the world, do you think about the opportunity that your kids have as they see you living your life? Are you living a life for Christ? Are you the hypocrite that the world thinks that you are? That's what they think. They were just a bunch of hypocrites. That's what they think. That's what the world thinks of you. That's what they think of me. 
we're just a bunch of hypocrites. We have no standard, no principle that we just say, we, don't, we just talk the talk, we don't walk the walk. Amen. Hey, <laughs> there's room for more. Amen. I want to be the person that the people think I'm supposed to be. I want to be the person that my sons think that I'm supposed to be, that, I, that I've uh, preached to them. I want to be the person that they expect me to be. I don't want them to find a day when they have to come home or they have to hear from somebody that your dad, who is supposed to be a, a minister or supposed to be a part of a church, part, you know, claimed to be part of a worthy cause, something far bigger than himself, all of a sudden he fell on his face and he, and he did something despicable because he let the flesh have its way. I don't want them, I don't want them to ever hear that. What is that going to do to them? I know I'm preaching, I'm preaching a different in here but listen I want to be the person that they think I'm supposed to be the person that I claim to be I don't want this to just be something that I say that I love God I love God with all my heart mind and soul if you say that you love God then it's time to live like you love God if you tell him you love him then live like you love him be willing to give yourself for him give your whole life for him Oh, I, I love God, but <laughs> I'm not going to quit smoking. No, I'm not going to do that. I love him, but I'm not going to quit doing that. I'm not, I love God, but I'm not going to quit sinning. I love God, but I'm not going to quit looking at this nonsense on my phone. I love God, but man. Do you love God or not? Do you want God to make a difference in your life or not? Let him make the difference. Let him be the captain. Follow and carry out his orders. Do what it is that he's calling you to do. Leave no doubt. Leave no room for the devil. <laughs> Don't let the devil have any more ammunition than he already has on you. Every time I fall, the devil use that against me. For the rest of my life, he'll remind me of it. Every single time. From the time of a child, Brother Tommy, he'll remind me of it. I got baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and I became a new creature. <laughs> I committed myself to doing something different. That baptism, that didn't save me. That baptism didn't get me into heaven. That baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, that wasn't enough on its own to get me to where I want to go. It just wasn't. Listen to me, church. It wasn't everything that I need. I still need to live a life committed to God. I still need to have the Holy Ghost leading and guiding me in truth. I still need repentance. I still need to love my neighbor. I still need to treat people the right way. I still need to live according to this word. You still believe that thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, honor thy father and thy mother, keep the Sabbath... Keep it holy. Remember all those? You still believe those? You still remember? Have no other gods before me, no graven images. Don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You remember all those? We still hold ourselves to those? We still believe those are true? Well, if you believe those are true, you can wrap an awful lot of what we're supposed to be doing up. Amen. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Real quick. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. He sees Peter and Andrew fishing. He tells him, he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They're out there casting nets. And he says, follow me. You imagine Jesus Christ, he, he just walks up on them. And I don't know that they knew him. It don't seem like they did at the time. And he walks up and he's, as they're doing their work, as they're about their work, as they're about their labor, doing their thing, their own thing. He says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. They didn't waver. They didn't hem haul around. They didn't try to make things right. They didn't try to catch one more fish. They didn't. They didn't do that. They didn't try to live one more life in the world, one more day in the world, give me one more moment in the world. They didn't try to do that. Give me a little bit of time to get right. No, he said, follow me. And the Bible says in the 19th verse, or in the 20th verse here, 
And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Straightway, immediately, they dropped what it was that they were doing and they followed Christ. If we'd stand. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And straightway, the Bible says, they dropped their nets and they followed him. They stopped the life that they were living. Immediately, they seen Jesus Christ. They seen what it was that he had to offer. They seen the reward in the distant future. You have to look out in the distant future, church. You have to look ahead. When you're... You know that, that old saying, when you're climbing a mountain, occasional glance towards the summit, you got to look at the summit once in a while. you got to understand the reward that's waiting for you. That there's something better. That there is going to be labor. And there's going to be perseverance. And there's going to be commitment involved. Before you ever have reward, there's going to be a little work. The Bible says the man that won't work won't eat. The things that need to be taken care of in Christ should be taken care of. These men, Peter and Andrew, they didn't, they didn't ask. They didn't consider the life that they've always known. This was their life. This is all that they knew. And they laid it down immediately. They dropped it. And they followed Christ. The Bible says if you want to save your life, you'll have to lose it. That means losing your life. That means giving a giving giving yourself, not giving yourself to the affairs of this life or the entanglements of this life or the desires of the flesh, but dropping the desires of the flesh, putting that behind you, giving of yourself, losing your life for his sake that you might find. It's a worthy cause. I believe, like Paul the apostle said, I finished the race. The finish line is important. I say it all the time. That finish line is important. You got baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Brother, that's a good start. That's a real good start. But that finish line is important. We got to make it over the finish line. Because that first step don't mean nothing if you don't make it over the finish line. That reward isn't coming for you if you don't make it over the finish line, if you haven't endured until the end, if you don't overcome this old man and you become the new creature that Christ called you to be. That good start isn't enough. That baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is not enough. That's necessary. You need that. Without that, you don't get to make it. You don't get to be washed white. Without that, you have to be the new creature that he called you to be. But that's just the start. That's just the beginning there's a finish line that you have to cross. There's some hardness that you have to endure. There's a life, a battle ahead of you, still to be fought. Amen. Always you have a purpose. Always you'll have a battle to fight. Don't ever think that you can get lax on God. You don't have time to pick up the things of the world. Amen. Only to put them behind you. Right now I'm going to call an altar call. I want you to think about what God really means to you, what he's done for your life, what he has potential to do for your life. What do you want him to do for your children and grandchildren? As we open the altar, I want you to come and pour your heart out to him. Give him everything that you have to give him. Ask him to come alongside you and help you to have the strength, the courage, the knowledge, whatever it is. We got to make it. We've heard that a lot today. We have to make it. We definitely can make it, but the making is going to be up to you thing we say at work all the time, we got the talking done. We're, we got the talking part done. Now it's time to get the doing part done. Amen. Come on, church. Let's pray. Let's open up the altar. Let's take time to pray. If you need repentance, repent. If you need to pray for the Holy Ghost. You want God to fill you with the Holy Ghost? Then come up here and pray for it. Church, get behind them. There's people that need help here tonight. Let's pray together. Let's have an altar call. Let's enjoy the presence of the Lord. Amen. Let him be the captain of your life. Come on, church.